Well, hello. Thank you for tuning in to Lessons of Vietnam Show, where we try to tell the real story of uh, the men and women who uh, fought in Vietnam to uh, dispel some of those myths and misunderstanding and downright lies about the Vietnam War and so forth. And we have back with us tonight uh, Mr. Mike Hook. Cook, excuse me, got my mics mixed up there for, for a second. <laughs> I'm just sitting here talking to him. Mike Cook, and uh, he was on the uh, last show. We're going to do a follow-up today and uh, finish up what he didn't get to talk about. And if you have anybody out there that uh, wants to hear about, um, hear from a great Vietnam vet, uh, a platoon leader, uh, <clears throat> good guy all around. Don't tell him that but because uh, his head swells up and his hat gets too tight. <laughs> but uh, get him to tune in to listen to uh, LT Cook. Uh, if you need to contact me with some information uh, later, uh, you can see on the screen there my email address, dixonbuild80 at yahoo.com. But even better, if you wanted to uh, call in today to talk to Mike or to uh, – Tell him that he didn't know what he's talking about or ask him a question. Whatever mm -hmm. you want to talk to Mike about, uh, try to keep it to Mike today since he's the guest uh, uh, today. Uh, just call in to 919-518-9773, uh, as you see there. Or even better, uh, if you come in on Skype, it's con Computers 2K Voice and uh, make comments or let us know you're there. Uh, we'd appreciate uh, any contact that you can give us. But, uh, Mike, uh, you've uh, recovered from the snow and so forth we had. We had uh, pretty good snow for a couple of days there. For anything, any snow is good for us mm -hmm. here in North Carolina. But um, uh, you, how do you want to start on your slides? you want to just go back into your story? We were, which one, you, how do you want to start? Let's, let's start with a slide, and we'll go from there. Yeah, and then we'll, let's finish them up. Right. And, uh, okay. And then we, and uh Actually, uh, you know, as you can see, I'm not young anymore, and I really don't remember what I talked about last time, so I'm allowed to talk about a lot of things again or change some stories, so, uh, you know, bear with me. In other words, out there, if he tells a story <laughs> different this time, you call us and let us know, because uh, I don't remember either. So. But uh, but I'm glad to be here, and, uh, uh, and mainly I feel like I'm uh, representing. I've notified a lot of them. I hope a lot of them are watching, but I, I'm mainly here representing uh the boys I serve with over there of Company A, 1st Battalion, 18th Infantry, the 1st Infantry Division in 69 and early 70, and uh, my platoon, Mike Platoon. So, uh, and that's their picture is, there on the screen. This is for you guys and a yeah. uh, great bunch of guys. Great and bunch I, of guys. I believe that's you standing off to the far left with your, with your hand on your on your hip. The little bitty one. The yep. little guy. Smallest guy in there, and I was glad to be the smallest one because uh, small as a... A uh, harder target, I guess, but uh, I was pretty much the smallest one in the platoon. But they, they were just great guys. Now I noticed they're all everybody's wearing boonie hats. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. This is back in the rear area now. When we went out in the field, uh, we were required to wear steel pots, and uh, I don't remember even carrying my boonie hat out there because uh, a steel pot uh, felt mighty good when the shrapnel and stuff started flying, and uh, it felt mighty comfortable. But uh, Boonie hats back in the rear base areas. Yeah, we weren't allowed to wear either. We were not allowed to wear boonie hats. We had to wear that ugly, army, greasy, stupid hat that mm -hmm. we have, used to have to wear. It's uh, it was terrible to wear. It was ugly mm -hmm. as all get out. But uh, yeah, baseball looking hat. Oh yeah. yes, yeah. it was terrible. But uh, it was. wouldn't let us have boonie hats. But somehow we wore them anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we mm -hmm. all. If we left, if when we left uh, left base, we had to have we had to have our flak jacket and our helmet. Um, uh, with us when we line out. Now we never, I never saw a flak jacket. Uh, they were too hot and heavy, so I'm glad they didn't oh, force yes. them. Oh the only thing good for it was a sit on. Mm -hmm. And I never saw a bayonet. I guess if they showed us a burn bayonet, we'd have said, "Uh oh, I don't believe I want part of this game." You know, close quarters, you know. But anyway, we we didn't need them, yeah. and uh, no entrenching tools. Didn't have to dig foxholes. We didn't stay in one place long enough. Uh, Moving around, setting up ambushes and what have you. So uh, it could could have been a lot worse. Well, I see uh, George here is sitting down eating his uh, wonderful uh, sea ration meal, and uh, that's yeah, George McDaniel. He uh, he was my second RTO. I won't tell you what happened to the first one, but uh, actually the first one <laughs> was grabbed by the co a new company commander after Captain Kelly was killed. 
uh, Kermit Cubit. He was a fine RTO also, and they they had to carry a lot of extra weight, you know, with that uh, prick twenty five is what they called the radios and. Uh, and uh, so they, he, he got to have the antenna, which was a good target. <laughs> As a matter of fact, well, I hate to jump, but hey, this was I, a I good just, one. This is jump around all you <laughs> want to. When I got transferred to the 25th Division, we went into Cambodia in the spring of 1970, what they called the Cambo uh, Sanctuary Incursion. So it was the advertised one. They had uh, riots over at Kent State and everywhere about it, but uh, that's okay. But I was following the... Uh, the battalion commander, the 4th Battalion, 9th Infantry, 25th Infantry Division, around a, a, a corner in a trail in Cambodia about the third day we'd been there. And the uh, colonel's RTO, they were probably 10 meters at the most in front of me. All of a sudden, they opened up from the blind side of the curve, and I can see in slow motion to this day that leaf antenna being shot into and floating slowly to the ground. Hmm. And uh, instinctively, I charged the side and was getting ready to open up. And then they said, oh, it's our guys, our guys, hold up, hold up. So, uh, but uh, our guys, you know, a lot of accidents happened in uh, hmm. Vietnam and Cambodia and everywhere. And, and their bullets were key just as quick as anybody else's. But uh, I'll never forget seeing that antenna float to the ground in slow motion. Well, how would you, how's your RTO? Did he get hit? No, he's got a good souvenir. He brought home. I'm sure he brought home that that leaf antenna and uh, uh, and a part of it that he had left and uh, replaced a, it. Yeah, his uniform probably had a little stain on it. <laughs> but uh, that was that was quite an experience. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the first uh, first picture you had it was back at the rear our rear area in, in Zion. We didn't get to go there that often, but when we did, we could let a hair down and drink more beers and. Uh, Hey, the army, it wasn't all bad because we got free beer, three sundry packs with Tootsie Rolls, Lucky Strikes. That's what I liked, and nobody yeah, else liked them. Mail, so I got strikes. all the Lucky Strikes and Pell Mills yeah. there was, and the other guys got the uh, more popular filtered kind, but uh, hey, it got me hooked on them, and I loved them. And, uh, hey, get riding helicopters, and uh, we were young, and... and and, you know, like I, I alluded to last time, yeah, I, I didn't run and uh, I didn't join up, and but and I didn't really want to go, but uh, going was because my country called. And whether it's a screwed up war or not, that's the way this country works. If your country calls, you got to go. And uh, But when you get in a situation like this, you fighting because you don't want to be embarrassed <laughs> in front of your buddies and that kind of stuff, although I wasn't, uh, you know, one day. But the buddies, I knew everybody by the last names, and uh, and uh, you know uh, I had to lead them. But uh, still, we were we were a tight knit family. That I would have died for any one of them, and they would have died. Any one of them would have died for me. And it's a it's a hell of a nice feeling. Uh, and now now same thing. I stay in touch with uh, about uh, eighteen to twenty of the guys in my platoon. And uh, one of them called me up right now. I'm on my way. And I think the same thing would happen yeah. if uh, I called one of them. That's uh, one of the things you get out of uh, being in that extreme situation mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. the closeness there. I, I, the, pic the slide we have uh, right now is your uh, uh, company commander, Captain Kelly, who was, uh, you lost him sh a couple weeks after you were there, I believe. About two or three weeks after I got there. And, uh, I, you know, of course, didn't, I'd gone through infantry OCS at uh, Fort Bend in Georgia about six months. But, uh, hey, it's a lot of things they don't tell you or you can't tell you or you can't teach you. And uh, it, it takes a while to get it, uh, get the hang of it. And uh, for it to happen that quick was, was a shock. Plus, uh, in that two or three short weeks that I knew him, he was just one hell of a guy, one hell of a leader. And... Uh, Hey, he he tell you right quick. I want you to salute me and be uh be uh military, but uh you knew he'd 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 be with you no matter what, and uh, so that was a big loss. Uh, November the twentieth, nineteen sixty nine. Uh, the next slide we're going to show you. Uh, it is not twins. It's two pictures of the same guy. When I first uh, look at it, I'm going. Those guys mm -hmm. really uh, identical twins, but then Mike explained to me 
uh, that it's the same guy, just two different pictures. He's uh, one, he's uh, mm-hmm. putting uh, sea rations in his mouth, and one, he's mucking one of them uh, lucky strikes. Mm-hmm. But, uh, mm-hmm. He was your, it says uh, he was your uh, platoon leader. He was the platoon leader, Mike platoon leader before me. Usually you serve about six months and then you get a, a, a fairly plus job back in the back, uh, plus, plush. Plush, I should say, P L U S H. So you become one of them. Out of the field. You become one of them rimps. I would have loved it, but I didn't make it because it withdrew the first division. And uh, of course, I, my time was a little shorter than six months being out in the field because they withdrew the first division. So they uh, my... doing, uh, uh, mm-hmm. starting, I guess that was kind of the starting of uh, Nixon's uh, Vietnamization, started pulling units out. Yep. Yep. But mm-hmm. you didn't have enough time to come home in country, so they switched you to 25. Oh, unless you were about ready to come home anyway. It was, we got all excited when we heard about uh, they were withdrawing uh, the 1st Division, but uh, soon found out uh, the way the Army uh, mathematics works, unless you were real close to getting ready to come home anyway, you just got transferred somewhere else. So I got transferred to the 25th Division, which was about the same level as far as north or south. I didn't want to go any farther north than I had to because the area we went in was uh, mostly VC, small groups, and uh, that's better than big groups of NVA any time you want to cut it. For but, new uh, people who, who didn't get to see the last show, you were uh, about 30 miles uh, north of, of Saigon mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. in three corps, I believe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. The terrain uh, wasn't too, too bad. It wasn't yeah. uh, it's pretty flat. Uh, Jungle what, wasn't too what, thick. It wasn't, swamp, wasn't swampy, nope. and it wasn't, mm-hmm. it wasn't the uh, Central Highlands and so mm-hmm. forth. So. Mm-hmm. We had our share of the mosquitoes and but leeches. But you had the mosquitoes and the leeches mm-hmm. and, the, and the thick jungle and, uh, and elephant grass and all that good. And those badass ants. Oh, they yes. would eat you up. Uh, the ant hills, five or six feet tall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, uh... But we worked our, our rear base was, like I say, Zion, spelled D-I-A-N, uh, and this is uh, Norman, Normandy 3, our fire support base, probably about five miles north of uh, Zion down the dirt road. Right, tell was, us what a fire support base is. That's where you've got uh, security, self-contained security all the time. Artillery pieces uh, are there. And uh, you come back in there in between uh, going out into the jungle and work out of there mostly. And uh, so there's a guard in a, on a barbed wire perimeter all the time on a fire support base, like like there was a Zion actually, but they had fancy uh, bunkers and and real permanent permanent guards. But uh, this uh, you can see the colonel's bunker back behind us. Uh, most of us had tents or or something, just slept on the ground, you know, sleeping a poncho liner. That was uh, that was pretty comfortable and. Uh, you get wet when it rained. We didn't want to uh, use ponchos because it make too much noise. But uh, this is at uh, the commanding general of the first division was coming down, passing out medals. And like I talked about last time, the uh, medals were pretty freely passed out if you uh, uh, did a good job of uh, of killing the enemy. Which hey, I, I, I don't apologize for it. I feel good about it because that was a job and that made it safer for me. And my boys. And, What's uh, the situation? If you don't kill them, they're going to kill you. Then uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, fire support base. If you're out in the field and you needed uh, artillery or whatever, that's when you got your radio guy got on the phone and called the uh, radio and got mm-hmm. on and called the fire support base and said, uh, send me some artillery with Mm-hmm. And you had mm-hmm. to look at the map and tell him where to send it. And I'd know within 20 miles probably of what my location was. <laughs> it wasn't easy, but uh, I had a, a, a terrain uh, map that showed the contours and uh, and that kind of stuff, streams and uh, and little paths and that kind of stuff. So and, there weren't uh, a whole lot of street signs out there. No, no. And uh, uh, usually the platoon leader had to kind of walk point because uh, we'd it was easy to get lost out there, so that way I was keeping up with the compass directions and the map and the paces and uh, kind of, after a while, not getting too lost, actually, but artillery, we didn't, we were a little wary of calling that in because close support, of course, they'd pop the first few rounds up in the air where you could see what was going on before they dropped them on the ground, but uh, that wasn't that effective in our situation, so with small groups, mm-hmm. yeah, helicopters. Right here, I showed you the Claymore last week. That was our main killing weapon. 
This smoke grenade came in different colors. This one's live, too, so please don't let anybody grab the pen. But uh, you just pull the pin. I mean, pull the ring, and the pin comes out, and you, it's got a handle on it just like a real grenade, and throw it, and your radio operator calls in for help and tells them what the situation is right quick. And I'm going to tell you the truth. You know how in an emergency you feel like it takes forever for the ambulance or something to get there to you. I remember these guys got to us quick. Metal backs, uh, dust offs to, to get our wounded out got to us damn quick. I support got there quick. I, I, you know, that's a good feeling to know that they backed us like that. And uh, well, you, know, you can't say enough for the medevacs and so forth. It's, mm -hmm. It just the helicopter takes both hands and both feet to steady them anyway, mm -hmm. and to sit there and bullets flying all around mm -hmm. you, hitting the plexiglass windows and so forth, and to sit there and sit and still. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how a man could do that, but his uh, his job was, hey, you got a wounded man. He needs to come back and, and, and get that wounded man and get him to the hospital. Uh, those guys mm -hmm. were phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were, and uh, we, we appreciated it, and, and they would come in. And uh, when I, I talked about rimps last uh Last time I was here, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put people you, I, like that. <laughs> uh, rear echelon, uh, MFs, yeah, uh, MFs. We or, didn't, we didn't like mighty it too fine. Well. Would be one of the ways to go MF. You know, mighty. We fine. would have traded places with them at any time, but we were proud to be infantry. I'm gonna tell you, it's uh, combat infantryman's badge. Yeah, I, I wear take it on your my... head off and show them that CIB. That's uh, uh, that's called the CIB, combat infantry badge, and you can't unless you are infantry. 11 Bravo or somewhere along that line. Special Forces. You can't get one. one. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to be in combat. Us, us RIMP called them 11 Bullet Stoppers, 11 Bs, 11 Bullet Stoppers. Now, those those pilots, they, they, they did some hairy stuff, too. And, uh, uh, hey, I, I salute everybody that answered the call. So I, I, don't, I don't mean to. You, 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 each one of us had a job as they needed you to do it, and uh, you did it. So I, I I I salute all of y'all, no matter whether I'm gonna call you a rent or not. But uh, hey, I'm proud of my combat hey, infantry badge. Those and... rimps got you the food, the ammunition, <laughs> the weapons, the clothes, yeah, uh, the, the doctors, mm -hmm. and so forth. So, but uh, and I thank all of y'all for serving serving America. And uh, hey, at the point at the point we were there in late '69, early '70, everybody there. Everybody back over here, London Baines Johnson and uh, McNamara, if he hadn't quit by then, whoever was uh, running it by then, uh, uh, some of them guys didn't have a clue, but uh, we knew it was a lost cause. Uh, Nixon's Vietnamization to wind things down. Uh, at the end of our last couple of months, I was with the 1st Division. We had uh, the Hands Together program. They drew pretty packed. Uh, posters with a Vietnamese hand and American hand holding hands together. And uh, they would actually go out with us on some ambush patrols and we'd set up outside villages. And uh, to be honest, about 12 o'clock, usually we'd hear a noise over there. And it was kind of dangerous anyway because we couldn't communicate with them. And uh, they were packing up and going back home. And uh, so, hey, it, it's just. But anyway, hey, we did our job. Any of you uh, uh, watching that lost a loved one in the war? When I when I got back, when I came up to Raleigh after I got out of the army in 1972, one of my first customers selling automobiles, Ford automobiles, was from Durham. And somehow Vietnam came up, and they asked me, he said, was it worth it? Our son got killed over there. Was it worth it? Well, oh, oh. <laughs> how do you answer that question? And I thought a second, and I said, well, yeah. Because, hey, that's not our decision. That's the leader's decision. That's the way the country works. If we just all get to vote on the war, hey, what if we had a war and nobody showed up? Well, hey, that might be a good idea. But, you know, like uh, we could be taken over by, by a foreign country. Uh, little North Korea would come over here if we are just all laid down and say we ain't going to fight no matter what. You know, so if your country calls, you got to fight, and that's what it's all about. And so, yes, it was worth it in that respect. The fact that the politicians screwed it up, and uh, maybe there was no way to not screw it up, uh, to do it in Vietnam. It's, it's tough. A guerrilla war is tough. 
And uh, we kill more. Tough, but when you don't take territory, you don't know who you, who the good guys mm-hmm. and the bad guys are. It's hard to, uh, it's hard if you can't keep score. It's hard to mm-hmm. uh, to know and so forth. But, we killed uh, a hell of a lot more of them than they killed of us. But in the end, hey, that didn't quite do it. Now this uh, the picture up now. I guess that's on the screen. Okay, there you go. Is uh, our lieutenant colonel, the battalion commander. Uh, he had just gotten there about a month before me in early October, and he, uh, we, I liked, some of the boys have said, hey, man, he's sending us out in six-man groups. That kind of makes you pucker up, you know. I mean, my God, because she carried three or four claymores and a whole bunch of smokes, smoke grenades, and the, and the choppers and everything would come in quick. And, uh, and rather than us having to wander around out there after we uh, got into a little firefight, they become blow the hell out of the area and spend whatever it took to do it. So again, we appreciated that. They were they were willing to uh, not just sacrifice us needlessly. They'd come in and throw everything they could at the, around us. And the jungles, it's hard to see too far. It's hard to see to shoot yeah. long distance, you know. So uh, we 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 got help. But he he came in and and got us setting up ambushes and uh, and rather than beating around the bush and getting ambushed by them. Yeah, and there, it worked. It uh, worked large well. groups out there. I mean, they, you know, you're not supposed to walk a trail, but it never made sense to me Everybody when you're out there with a machete, <laughs> hacking your way through the jungle. Yeah, uh, you might as well be walking the trail mm-hmm. just about because you make it. And I know you're coming thirty minutes mm-hmm. when you get there. Yeah, and they did uh, it to you. The enemy did it to you, and uh, that's what yeah. we'd set up. We'd find a good trail, and set up there and just be quiet. And I, where we were, anybody was out there. Won't know, won't know uh, villagers out there, friendly villagers out there for a Sunday picnic. Anybody out there was uh, a bad, a bad guy. And uh, a lot of times we didn't even see them before we killed them. And uh, those claymores blowing and grenades blowing and uh, the helicopters coming in real quick. It uh, it saved a lot of our lives and. Uh, and eventually, yeah, we would have to get up and sweep the area, but we didn't do it too quick. <laughs> we made damn sure everything was digging out there first, and then we'd get out and sweep. And uh, uh, one day, I remember in particular, I got it, we got up and, and swept after we'd blown an ambush and killed about three. I'd caught one getting ready to play with my claymore, and I blew the claymore, and it oh Lord, it blew arms off. And, you know, it, it, he was so close. It was just, claymore was a terrible weapon. But uh, it was it was a good weapon for neutralizing the enemy. So when we went out and and, and checked out the area, one uh, VC jumped up. I almost passed him, and I was in front. Jumped up, and if he if he'd have wanted to start shooting at me, I'd been dead. But the two boys behind me, both from Tennessee, Tennessee Mountain boys, they opened up on him and scared the hell out of him, and he took off. And we called in artillery all night on him. We heard mo- mo- moaning later on. So. Uh, we might have got him one way or the other, but uh, it, that sweeping and chasing after him was dangerous as hell. Now, because when you they say not sweep, sweeping for the non-veterans out there, that's basically you get up and go and look and see uh, because yeah. uh, mm-hmm. headquarters warned you to have my body count. Mm-hmm. So you had to mm-hmm. go out and, and make sure they were mm-hmm. out there, get the weapons and, and count bodies and mm-hmm. pick up their weapons and so forth. But they were pretty good at uh, because of their religion and so forth to police in their bodies and, and police in their, uh, uh, you know, quite often they didn't have enough guns to go around to everybody. So uh, they were pretty good at going out and policing up their, mm-hmm. uh, their dead and so forth. So, but you had to go out and, and policing is, or, or mm-hmm. sweeping is going out and looking at what's there, what they've left and mm-hmm. if there's any intelligence and that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. So. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did uh, uh, find AKs. They, they would, uh, <laughs> When they were them claymores, man, when them things start going, each man carry about three or four of them suckers. And uh, when them things start blowing and tearing limbs off, we found a lot of dropped AKs. And uh, they'd haul ass, thank goodness. Yeah, and, for those of uh, you out there who don't know what a claymore is, it's somewhat like a semicircle that you face that uh, part of it towards where you think the enemy's coming. And it's full of ball bearings. Mm-hmm. About and you got a clicker, and when mm-hmm. you click that wire, is run to a wire, and you hit that clicker, it just blows out uh, ball bearings that will cut trees down and people mm-hmm. and two mm-hmm. and so forth. Uh, so you set those out when you're on ambush or if you're just going to spend the night in some place. Mm-hmm. You put those mm-hmm. out, and when you hear somebody coming down, uh, you don't want to 
uh, fire your weapon because they know where the uh, where the shot came from. But when that claymore mm-hmm. goes off, um, it uh, it's pr- it's pretty nasty if you're in the vicinity. It it clears them out. But uh, yeah, sometimes they would uh, we 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 find a fair amount of AKs and uh, and they were getting the hell out of you know out of our vicinity right quick and. Uh, they drop it if they had to, and, and, and claymore balls, you know, slicing all around. And most, we hardly ever, hey, and uh, we, we killed them, and I ain't, I ain't lost a, a minute's sleep because, hey, that made us safer. But we did not murder. You can murder somebody in war, I think. We did not go out and mistreat anybody laying there dying, and most of them from them claymores, we didn't have to medevac any wounded, which we would have wounded enemy. And uh, but we didn't mistreat them, threaten them, act like they were gonna kill them, anything like that. I've held them while they died, and uh, hey, they're human sin, and they're no longer a threat. And we didn't cut off ears, we didn't murder any, we didn't throw any out of helicopters. Now I'm sure, hey, somewhere something happened. Everything that I'm talking about, I didn't hardly see much of, and don't believe happened hardly ever. Maybe happened once in a while in the war. But I'm telling you what I saw in my area, and uh, we just didn't do that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was 3 million veterans served in, in country Vietnam, 3 million over 10 years. There's something like that happened somewhere, mm-hmm. sometime in that 10 years and 3 million men there. But it was not, as the movies came to show, it was not something that happened every day in every group. It was... It was the uh, not the norm at all. It was not standing operating procedure uh, to go out there and, and, and do that sort of stuff. Uh, I see here on the uh, next slide we have there, uh, somebody made uh, y'all's insignia. Was that your group's insignia? That was actually, I think, started. That was made in Vietnam. They had uh, pretty crudely made patches, which are uh, yeah, most desirable. Yeah, Mama make some yeah. patches like that. You, you, know, as far as you had to be careful they got wet because they ran. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, I think, started out as, as uh, first of the 18th recon uh, insignia. But I've I've, I've seen it, uh, ref- the whole battalion referred to later as swamp rats and vanguards and one thing after another. But uh I, in my collection and display that we're going to show you in a little little bit mm-hmm. that I carry around to various functions to uh, to uh, for the enjoyment of veterans that come and e- educate the public uh, about what we used and what we did and pictures and what have you. I've been to some reunions where that thing you just saw, that mm-hmm. was tattooed on some of the boys' arms. On the arm. So they, they got attached to, hey, patches. You know, that was kind of... Uh, Showed uh, you were part of the family, you know, yeah. and uh, and the swamp rats they 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 tattooed them on the arm sometimes. Well, uh, our next slide shows a, a Sergeant Bill. Uh, how do you pronounce his name? Maltis. Maltis. Bill Maltis. He was wounded by a booby trap. Now, what kind of booby trap was it? A punchy stick or was it an explosive? Oh no! By by late '69, they they'd modernized and we'd given them enough. Uh, uh, unexploded uh, artillery rounds, mortar yeah. rounds, and what have you that they could uh, booby trap. And uh, after we did so good with the ambushes, about the last January and February, uh, First Division actually went into the rear of about February the 18th of 1970. So about the last two months, they kind of started pulling us back into normal operations, like go, uh, checking around the villages that were close by the fire support base. And about January of 1970, we keep going back in the same area because it won't that many areas and you were uh, uh, easily seen by the villagers. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were a few bad guys in there. Uh, our villages we were close to were pretty friendly and uh, we didn't have to worry about uh, like uh, Parang Mila, you know, getting shot at all the time. It never got shot at out of the village. But uh, Bill hit a booby trap and he was a, a, a fine, uh, he became a squad leader. He came over there right after I did and he was just a natural. A lot of these sergeants were just naturals. You know, you had to take us lieutenants and beat the hell out of us for six months to make a lead out of a lot of us, but uh, most of these sergeants we had were just naturals. Natural charisma, natural coolness. Uh, Batoon Sergeant, Sergeant uh, Mercer, out of Oklahoma, he just had a coolness about him. He was just, oh, he, and and you, and a lot of times he would be running one half of the platoon and I'd be off with the other half somewhere else. or. Uh, he he was uh, 
could do it as good as good as me or anybody else there. So uh, was this young man medevaced out? Did he come back? Or they, he medevaced out. He it 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 uh, messed up. His, it didn't blow any legs off, but he had a lot of shrapnel wounds yeah. in his legs, and I hated to see him go. He was just a a, a good up from New Jersey. He got, did he go get to go home? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that I guess in a way was the million dollar wound, but yeah. uh, we're getting ready to pull out anyway. But he'd have gone somewhere else because he come in after me. But I hated to see him go. He was a good guy, and uh, missed him. But uh, well, our next picture next here picture is, is... Uh, M60 machine gunner, <laughs> and uh, he has uh, one of his uh, a girlfriend with him. And I'm not got. We wrote on there as because I told you I thought he had a prostitute there sitting outside the village. But hey, that's a cool picture. He was a yes. big guy from Tennessee, uh, one of about ten. Had uh, about nine or ten brothers and sisters from Tennessee mountains, East Tennessee. Johnny Dalton, we called him Jethro. He he carried the M60, and uh, he's. Uh, I don't think they got beer at that point because we probably on a. a Checking out the village, it looks like we're probably in the area outside one of the villages. So the girl came out there, and I, I can't swear that she was a prostitute, but uh, hey, well, let hey, me say right now, making a difference. I, 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 when I, if I call anybody a prostitute, those girls were angels. I have the highest regard for being girls because uh, hey, the guys didn't have time to go into the villages and uh, and 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 court. Uh, and build up a relationship over a couple of months. Uh, they wanted love right then, and hey, I wanted you know I didn't I didn't try to stop in and that. And uh, well, you know, those girl, us, some of those girls uh, yeah. supported their whole families doing that. And I, mm-hmm. I see she's probably that's probably a coke bottle there. That's it's a coke amazing. bottle. amazing. You could be in uh, you could be in a firefight, and a few minutes later uh, they'd mm-hmm. be out selling cokes. Yeah, uh, yeah, but they uh. I mean, <laughs> they just relaxed and having a good time. I love that picture. Yeah. But uh, uh, Jethro, we called him. He w- he was tough as they come. He would be right behind you and right there with you, no matter where you went. Yeah, and, M6 uh, is pretty pretty hefty thing to carry all day. Now the other M60, we had two M60s in the platoon. The other one, Thomas Merriman, he carried M60. He was about my size. He was pretty mm-hmm. small, but uh, and and he went on to uh, the 101st Airborne after they withdrew the first division. And was killed in Cambodia in uh, in the spring of 1970. A good guy, but uh, usually it, it, it worked better for a big guy to carry the M60. Oh uh, yeah. A lot of a lot of accidents happened. This next picture coming up is Walter Nunley. I believe we showed a picture last time of the company commander's daughter at a reunion yes. visiting his grave in Tennessee mm-hmm. and putting flowers on top of his uh, headstone, and uh, and. Uh, you know, we don't forget people like this. This was an accident, but a lot of a lot of the deaths and injuries in war are from accidents. It's, yeah, it's, no, you it's know, we call it friendly fire, but it ain't mm-hmm. that friendly. Yeah, and that was walking right, there. She is right there. Yep, yep. We went over at, at a reunion in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I think, and uh, uh, she and uh, me and my wife and about four or five double guys. Uh, uh, Sunday after the reunion was about over, went over there and paid respects to uh, uh, Walter Nunley. He was from Chattanooga, Tennessee, actually. But on January the uh, January of 1970, a tank accidentally discharged a flechette round that uh. Uh, one of our platoons, November platoon, I believe, uh, was around uh, right, around the tank, uh, checking out some areas in the jungle and. Uh, it killed uh, him and Lorenzo Neely uh, instantly. They wounded uh, Bobby Barris and uh, another soldier that I yeah, can't call uh, his name right now, but Bob Barris is probably watching right now. For those of you out there might wondering what a flechette is, it's almost like a needle, mm-hmm. uh, sharp as razors, but like a needle, and it will do terrible things to a body. Uh, it just... I don't know how many was in a round, but there was a bunch mm-hmm. of them and so forth. Yeah. And the terrible. slide we just saw was Robin, uh, the daughter of the captain that you, we mm-hmm. saw earlier mm-hmm. with the uh, with the towel. Uh, like I said last time, she's she's kind of the spirit, our spiritual leader. She's just so much like she's about four years old when uh, her dad was killed, and uh, and uh, she, she's told about how the uh, family would. Uh, 
tell, it was easy to tell because of the unfriendliness about Vietnam uh, to a schoolmates. Well, my dad's in Germany still, even after he was killed. And that's, that's damn sad. Yes. But uh, they lived through that, and their mothers uh, just never got over it. There were groups that actually called families of soldiers killed in Vietnam that would say, mm-hmm. Uh, we're glad they got killed. I can't, just, it just. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'd like to get a hold of some of those people. Mm-hmm. Just, um, but she's, she's, she's. We, it, we're lucky we find her, and she just looks like a dad. Uh, just in has. In fact, a lot. there's her dad standing right there with the big red one patch on the right. That's uh, Captain Kelly, and on the left, somebody uh, uh, emailed in. I think uh, you told me and said, uh, "I want to see my buddy uh, Mike Capasoli." That's old uh, wild man Mike on the left there. His arm bandaged up. He was the uh, Lima platoon medic, and uh, I don't know what happened to get his uh, arm in a in a bandage like that. There's no telling, but him. But uh, he was from New Jersey, and uh, after we got back, and I located a lot of the guys. He was one that was most thrilled by us finding some of his buddies, and he just uh, enjoyed staying in contact with them. He died about five years ago. Yeah, from, those, those medics are phenomenal because mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. a guy hollered Doc, most yeah. of the time they went. Yeah, yeah. He 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 ran some lonely trips between uh, positions to uh, go eight other guys, and uh, that yeah, they they didn't hold back. Yeah, that they, little that little red cross thing was a good target. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, they they shoot them just as just as quick as. Uh, they shoot anybody else. And the next picture coming up is uh, Captain Kelly. I believe he's on the left, and his brother on the right, I believe, back during World War II. It was more popular to uh, buy your kids uh, kid size uniforms. And uh, I've got some in my collection. I set up in the display some. Uh, but now you don't see it too much anymore. But uh, Well, back then, the whole country was involved in the war uh, with mm-hmm. the metal and, and Recycling and, oh, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, so it was big. Yeah, yeah. To show support. So. It was different. And uh, hey, again, we knew about the the protests going on against Vietnam, and it. I I, I don't recall anybody in the platoon or company just dwelling on it, getting upset about it. Hey, that's America. You got a right to do that. And actually, they knew more what was going on than President Lyndon Baines Johnson and Robert McNamara did. Uh, you know, really, if we weren't going to do it right. Uh, Somebody needed to tell them, I guess. But uh, anyway, that didn't bother us. Our country called and we went. All right, next picture coming up is a Huey. They call them Slicks. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this is from, uh, it says popping purple smoke. This is from the grenade you just showed them, the uh, that smoke was a, grenade. That was a green, green one green I just showed you. Purple. It had green on the top and uh, green written on it. And they came in purple and yellow and uh, I think a couple of them, maybe red. Uh, about five or six different colors. And so the reason when for the that, helicopter was coming in, he'd recognize and tell you what color smoke to make sure that the Viet Cong hadn't thrown out one. Then you verify uh, it. Yeah. yeah. He say, uh, he said, I, he'd say, I see purple smoke, and, and you say, yep. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't tell him first. Yeah, you know, somebody yeah. else allowed to pick up on the radio, but uh, you'd verify. Yep, that's us right here. Come on in, and uh, I believe he's bringing in water for us there on an operation, and that looks a little that, familiar. It looks like there might be one under the sling, or is that a tree in the background? Under no, the... he probably just threw out a bladder from the inside of the uh, helicopter. But that wood line over to the right, seemed like I remember seeing about three or four V.C. right after he did that, uh, kind of on the edge of that wood line. And uh, I alluded last time to, hey, we didn't go out and hide, but we did not charge across when I saw those, uh, I think this is spot uh, two or three or four VC on that wood line over there. I certainly is sure as hell did not take my guys and go charging over there, and probably would have lost one or two of them, and maybe gotten all three of them after we called the helicopters and shot the area up. Well, that but, could have been well leading you into an ambush themselves. So could have, and I and we got where we didn't even call that type of stuff in the headquarters actually, and. Uh, because they would, uh, you know, would just worry the hell out of them why we won't uh, just uh, gung-ho after after all that stuff. And officially, we weren't supposed to be chasing people, but uh, yeah. we, we just didn't do that kind of stuff. And this next picture is uh, sitting out. This this looks like in a rice paddy. You can see the uh, 
berm. Yeah, you, the green the, berm the green, and then the, right, the brown rice. They were squares, I'm going to probably say, with, with berms about a foot and a half to two feet high where they could fill them up with water. Now, most of the year they weren't filled with water. And they made good places to set up in a corner. And uh, that's a, a boy from Florida, Alfonso Daly on the right, and Dennis Bumi on the left. He was a... Uh, uh, I believe he ended up being a radio operator and in, in, in another group that uh, that we usually divided up into in Mike Platoon and uh, and he was both both good guys, uh, but we set up in a in a rice paddy like that one night <clears throat> and got way about a hundred meters away from the wood line. We'd been bumping into ambushes about once a week for a while, and I said, well, "Hey, let's get out here where nobody will find us." And I'll be damned if they didn't find us. They come out of that wood line and walk down the dikes, <clears throat> and we went in the corner, which made good protection. And uh, the colonel told me later, I said, you dumb ass, you're supposed to have two two or three guards, you know, all night long. But they had one guard uh, when I got there, and I, I didn't like to stay up. I, I didn't like to lose sleep. So we had one guard on, and uh, the one guard, they claim he fell asleep. But anyway, he, he, he was... Uh, had his arm flopped across that dike, and he wasn't looking the right way. And they came, the BC came out and stepped on his arm. And when I woke up, hey, a lot of things I remember the best at the time, uh, Lord, they will uh, make your hair stand on the end. But uh, now it's kind of funny. Yeah. The guy next to me would fire while, when I woke up, there were traces flying all over the place. They dropped about two or three. AKs in the uh, rice paddy the BC did that night, and uh, but when the, the funniest thing to me later, the guy next to me on my right, he would fire from one side of the berm about five seconds, and then he would jump to the other side of the berm and fire back the other way about five seconds, and then he jump, he did it about five or six times, shooting in both directions. And I said, well, he he just covering his bases, I guess. <laughs> I I've never found out who that was, but uh you know, I think Vietnam in the dark <laughs> is darker than any place in the world. Yep. Uh there is no street lights and if there's not mm-hmm. moon shining, uh, it is one more dark place. It and, is, and, and they and, called in they called in illumination uh uh the uh we we called that in because uh we thought we probably got a few of them uh in all the shooting, but they dropped the two or three AKs and we didn't find any bodies, but uh the company commander came back on the radio and said, and, and, uh, said, all right, call in some illumination. And that illumination brightens things up. Hey, it's too bright. Move it away. We can't see. Move I'm it back to, say, to me. Illumination makes you able to see them. They can see but us. But it makes you, uh, them that's able to see you. It's, yeah. It works both ways. So I moved it back and forth. And finally, uh, the company commander said, all right, get out there and sweep and uh, see what you can find. And I shouldn't have done it. At night like that, a rice paddy where they could be hidden behind a berm should not have done it. But uh, got up and did it. And uh, But one of the other lieutenants, the Lima platoon lieutenant, came on the radio and said, Mike, don't you dare do that. And uh, the company commander come back on and cussed him. That was uh, the one that took Captain Kelly's place. Yeah. And uh, he cussed him out. And uh, so I, I did it. But uh, it, it, it was Harry. You know, the sweeps were the hairiest things, uh, checking out areas, moving. If you're moving and the other side's not moving, they got the advantage over you. Yeah. So, uh, But we survived. Here's our uh, next picture is uh, Huey UH-1D. We call them slicks. And no doors. They take the side doors off, and that's taking off right outside of Normandy 3, right outside the wire. Got about six, seven, eight. I forgot exactly how many of them a platoon in there getting ready you to hit. You can see out. they're sitting on the side with their feet Hang hanging out. Hang your feet out, just having a ball, you know, until they get ready to land or if it's wet, wouldn't even land and just hover and say, jump out with your 70 pound pack and you jump out and go up to your ass in, in uh, mud, you know, and uh, cuss them. But uh, I guess they were afraid they'd get stuck. But anyway, the, the, the trip flying was, was beautiful, wonderful. If you but, see off to the left in that in that doorway, you see the door gunner there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had door gunners that stayed on each side that stayed with the chopper were part of the crew. And uh, we'd ride there, and then they'd set us down. And the first time I ever went into a, uh, uh, they dropped us off, uh, air assault into a little clearing, took the platoon, I think the whole platoon they took in after I'd been there a week or so. 
and uh, the uh, other choppers around us, the gunships, started opening fire on the wood line. And nobody told me they did that just for the hell of it, you know. And I said, oh, God, my first trip in, and we we get in a big damn fight. And, uh, but find out they just did that for the hell of it. <laughs> you know, well, just, make, just if, it make sure that the bad guys are in the woods. They're going <laughs> to stay down while you're coming up. down just yeah. to get out and, and, and get going. So uh, now There's a super trooper. That's when I, after I transferred to the 25th Infantry Division, which was, uh, worked uh, out of Coochie and Tainan, but uh, we usually worked out of fire support bases and, and again, went back to the yeah. larger places. But now Coochie, Tainan, places like that were really pretty they gone safe. Like Coochie. Well, that was a big base. So. They take they, they take the guys' weapons up when they come in. It was safer to do that than to take a chance on them getting drunk and shooting one another accidentally. Yeah. So it, it was pretty dang on safe. They had permanent guards there. And, uh, I was uh, was more or less a ramp there, and uh, well, you're a pretty sharp soldier back then. Oh yeah, yeah. You could if you stayed back at the fire support base. That was back at the fire support uh, base. I could, uh, I could nice get a, and clean uniform. And got me a forty five and a shoulder holster. Yeah, looks which looks like I, you got a little shine on those boots. And yeah, yeah. Couldn't hit the broad side of the barn with it. A forty five pistol yeah. is no match for a rifle. And M sixteen was working pretty well for us, and. Uh, and, you know, and, and really didn't need it that much because uh, the Claymore, like I've said, and the yeah. smoke grenades calling in the uh, helicopters uh, did most of the work for us right quick. But, uh, yeah, that's me all cleaned up. I was kind of skinny, too. If you saw a full, <laughs> full view of me, you see that kind of like uh, Bill over here, I'm not quite that skinny anymore. What's the next picture? Oh, uh, <laughs> now that's a soldier. That, that's a super lieutenant. <laughs> That's back when I was in the first division at Zion, probably about the end of uh, 1969. They had uh, containers captured AK-47s, and uh, that's an American grenade, uh, pineapple-type grenade, like we carried, and uh, we were just kind of horsing around. And, uh, hey, you know, the beer was free, and uh, and uh, plenty of toots and rolls and cigarettes, and you know we had some good times, and uh, so we were kind of goofing off. And uh, or the grenade in the mouth, I guess, was yeah. <laughs> was uh, John Wayne was always pulling the grenades with his teeth. You pull that pin with your big teeth out the wall, you know, have a problem. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I was careful not to do that. But we we uh, when we throw them doing the ambush, we pulled the pin and let the handle go, and they always told us four seconds. I don't know who told uh, who I've told us that. I hope they knew what they're talking about. But we we'd heard that if you throw them too early, they might can pick them up and throw them back at you. So I remember letting that uh, handle go and just waiting a second or two and then throwing that yeah. thing. And uh, uh, sometimes you get excited and let and throw the handle and everything all together. So yeah, I yeah. think I, we were told three seconds, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, probably safer. Sense. But I remember seeing those hand grenades bouncing off trees, and usually they keep on going the, yeah. the way you're throwing them, but they could have bounced back. And a lot of our wounds came from shrapnel. Uh, we threw so many hand grenades and uh, stuff. You never throw a grenade into a, uh, a straw hut. No, we didn't. We didn't. Do, we didn't we, like I say, we didn't. We worked around the villages and never had any problem out of the yeah. villages, so we never had to go in, in there. Yeah. Uh, this is a picture. I'm going to do a little advertising here. This is where I've. Uh, yeah, but uh, a collection. I brought some things back from Vietnam, but I wasn't uh, I would have sightseeing, you know, being out in the jungle that much, uh, and didn't think I was going to survive the damn thing. Tell you the truth, so I didn't worry about it. I'd always been a collector of military stuff, but uh, I, I brought a few things back. But uh, sweeping flea markets and searching everywhere, and friends giving me stuff. Uh, I've gathered up a pretty good collection of uniforms. So and, this uh, is only a small, small mm -hmm. fortune. I just thought you could get in the picture. Now, this is at the uh, North Carolina History Museum, History Museum for last our March, Vietnam experience that we do there. And mm -hmm. I, I, there's a table to the left, and, a, and there's a table back off to the right. And uh, you've got a lot of good stuff. And uh, uh, let's see, Ron Fitzsimmons uh, got, gave you a picture of his mm -hmm. bird dog, and mm -hmm. uh, Elry Smith gave you his, uh, his rack. For, he was uh, in Special Forces. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, to the right, you can see his tiger stripes. And uh, he gave me something pretty rare, a stable extraction harness. He was in special forces. Yeah. And they would go out in small groups deep in enemy territory. And when they got in, if they ever got in big trouble, they could call a chopper and they'd drop a rope and they'd hook up to that harness and jerk their butt out of there right quick. So, uh, 
Yeah, and yeah, I that, love it when that, I'm t- that tiger uniform. You didn't see a whole lot of those around in the in the rear. Mm, the special forces guys, yeah, like them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, now, uh, you somebody, travel all over. Uh, I know that uh, on uh, when uh, Golden Corral does their free mm-hmm. mails, you you out at the Golden Corral with your display. Set up and, in the uh, lobby. I do all wars out there, but uh, and I I've got name tags where I can. I like it when I know who used a particular thing, piece of equipment, or got a picture of somebody that was actually in the war, and it's kind of commemorating their service, plus I like to collect anyway. But, uh, hey, it it makes it doubly uh, feel good because, uh, and and let me say, hey, if any of you you got things hanging on your wall or you're going to give to the kids, by all means, great. Keep it forever. But I find stuff that is thrown out at the flea market all the time, and uh, nobody seems to give a... Uh, uh, happy damn about it, and uh, which is sad. And I buy it, and uh, if I can get up to a name of who it was, I put it with it and 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 put it in my uh, display. So if anybody's got anything, just call in the bill, and uh, uh, I make a good use of it. Never sell nothing. It is for the honor and memory of the guys who served. Well, uh, like I went to a, a funeral of my one of my aunts by marriage uh, last Tuesday. And uh, one of my cousins came up and said he had something for me. And uh, he gave me my grandfather's World War One discharge. Wow, great, great. 1918. And the flag that was on his casket. And he said he didn't really know my grandfather at the time because he was too young. But I tell you what, that was absolutely fantastic mm-hmm. to have that. I've got his picture in his uniform from World War II and... Uh, uh, to have this discharge and uh, uh, some more paperwork and, and have that flag, uh, it just it, it meant the world that my cousin would give it to me because uh, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't somebody he knew. But uh, oh, it's great because I was the I was the firstborn, mm-hmm. and uh, by the time he came along, I believe Pa was gone or or just shortly. Mm-hmm. He was just young, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that was very special. So if you have anything out there, and it's just sitting around and going to go bad. Uh, let us know. We'll get it to Mike, and and maybe even better if you can give it to us. We can get it to Mike, and uh, the story behind it. Your so your relative's story still lives on, rather than being mm-hmm. in a uh, up in an attic that's going to go bad, or in a in a, mm-hmm. under the house or something. It's mm-hmm. an opportunity for uh, kids to see. It's uh, part of the living history, and uh, whomever it belonged to, that was your family or whatever. Uh, some of their story will continue on. And, and again, uh, if you ha- hey, if you, if you you're feeling good about having it, and it's giving you a feeling of, of appreciating that service, or you just enjoy having the item, or your kids are gonna get it one day, don't give it to me. Don't give it to a museum. Don't give it to nobody. Keep it and love it. But if it's something that I can make better use of, I'd love to love to have it. So uh, that's a shameless commercial here. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we're trying to. It's a public service announcement. Yeah, <laughs> let me say before we get down and run hey, out of time, right? Just a couple of minutes yours, here. Uh, I, I would like to call the names again: Captain Harvey Kelly, our company commander, great uh, company commander, killed in action November the twentieth, nineteen sixty nine. He was a daring, uh, aggressive infantry leader. That was his second tour over there, and his daughter Robin. I hope is watching tonight, and we love her. The guys love her to death. And uh, one of my uh, Mike Platoon guys, uh, Claude Giles, his uh, widow is probably watching tonight. She's on our email uh, uh, network. And uh, Katie, uh, Claude Giles was still in Mike Platoon, but right at the end before we were getting ready to uh, transfer to other units back at Zion, he transferred to, uh, to a job guarding the perimeter of Zion, and actually he was in a group that was going out, setting up little positions outside the wire, and the snipers on the line mistook him for an enemy and shot and killed him accidentally. But, hey, he he, he died in the service of America, and he was a good guy. He was a good soldier, and uh, it was a loss to us. Well, Alan, a listening, listening post? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that. another job that mm-hmm. I don't. you don't want. What mm-hmm. you do is you basically go out, and find you a nice quiet spot outside the base 
Mm-hmm. And the idea is if they're gonna they're gonna attack the base, you see them first. <clears throat> but you may have to hunker down and dig down and, up and wherever you can be, because if they're gonna surround you and attacking the base, you can let the base know. But you don't always have an opportunity to get back in the base because they're all around you, and you just gotta pretend that you ain't there uh, until it's all over with. That's mm-hmm. a tough mm-hmm. position, and uh, mm-hmm. be shot by your own guy. It's uh. So I'm 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 sure glad they've had this chance to be here and uh, represent my uh, company in platoon and I I thank all of you that showed enough interest to, to tune in and thank you all for your service and uh, appreciate what you've done and uh, I'm sure proud of what I've done which won't a whole lot but uh, hey I could lay as low to the ground as anybody there and I <laughs> crawled inside of my steel pot several times but uh, and I was scared most of the time but uh, like a lot of y'all I did it anyway. And uh, and uh, the collection, like I say, I've always uh, kind of loved collecting military stuff, and and still do, and mainly display it in memory of uh, of those who served. But let me tell you something right now. I hate war. I really hate war. I remember I was set up out at the Capitol. I used to set up out at the Capitol for about twenty or twenty five years of display, about uh, ten years ago. Uh, uh, another group started coming in and setting up uh, close to me, and uh, I wore a, a peace symbol T-shirt underneath my jungle jacket. And I thought just kind of, you know, hey, the guys were wearing them, you know, drawing pictures of them on the helmet and everything else. You know, I didn't, I didn't mean disrespect to, uh, hey, when you got to fight, you got to fight. Well, if you, you know? remember, if you remember one of the pictures we saw a while ago, the uh, <laughs> uh, radio man had a peace sign hanging around his neck. I mean, over there mm-hmm. we wore them. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, hey, sometimes you just got to fight. But war is a is a great failure. It's a it's a sad thing that uh, you go out and kill another human being because you can't get along. So uh, hey, teach peace, please teach peace. Uh, live peaceful if you can uh, with your neighbors. And uh, back in 1950, Ed McCurdy, look him up on the computer. Ed McCurdy wrote a song, a nice song. Last night I had the strangest dream. And it, uh, let me tell you a few lines of it. Last night I had the strangest dream I'd never had before. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. Someday I hope so. That's it for me. All right. Well, Mike, we were glad you're here. Uh, you showed a different side of the story. <laughs> As you can see there, that's the Vietnam Service Ribbon, by the way. Uh, all gave some and some gave all. Mike has told you stories of uh, the men in his uh, platoon who gave some, and he's also told you the story of some who gave all. And all those who gave all have families out there, and they also gave every, what was very precious and dear to them. Uh, all the, uh, mm-hmm. the men and women who died fighting for our country uh, out there. Uh, our next show, the next slide here. Our next show will be February 14th. It's going to be a special show. It's going to be uh, Camp Lejeune Contaminated Water Health uh, Care Benefits. Uh, For the Marines who were stationed at Camp Lejeune uh, during the period of time, their families who also were there uh, got sick, and the civilian uh, workers. Uh, They have a cause of a camp. There's about 17 different diseases uh, that are, are presumed to be coming out of the contaminated water there. And the VA has finally got behind it and getting some stuff done. So Tony Mussolini from uh, down in uh, uh, Wilmington will be doing the show from there. Uh, we've had the PowerPoint slides uh, gone over by the VA, so we'll have a lot of uh, VA people watching and so forth. But if you know a Marine who was at... Um, uh, Camp Lejeune or somebody's family who someone worked there from about 53 on up. Uh, tell them about the show because uh, we need to get, the, if they've been sick or whatever, we need to get them some help and some benefits and so forth. And uh, Tony is going to be going over it and how to do it. If you know a veteran service officer, you might want to tell them to tune in uh, to see the show, uh, to get that information about how to fill out the paperwork and so forth. If you're out there, you're watching this live, realize that you can go back and watch it on demand anytime. And, oh, by the way, I want to tell you, if you do go back and watch it on demand, click on see video. 
if you click on the other part, a watch video, if you click on the other part, all you're going to get is the sound. You're not going to get Mike uh, Cook here with his uh, CIB uh, badge. But if you click watch video, <laughs> then you get the whole whole picture of Mike. Uh, I know it ain't much to look at, but uh, <laughs> uh, still you can get to see him and so forth. But uh, be sure and uh, go back and watch Mike again. And thank you again for tuning in. We're looking forward to uh, having you back with us as we sit down and talk about Vietnam and the men and women on February 14th. Until we see you then, good evening. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.